Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our fellowship here at the Tron and to our morning service. We'll be beginning in just a moment or two. Perhaps you join me just as we uh, quieten ourselves and uh, as we prepare ourselves to together call on the name of the Lord to sing his praise, to hear his voice, and to respond in our hearts. So as the musicians play, let's quietly prepare ourselves to come before the Lord. The Apostle Paul says that in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. We begin this morning by singing a hymn of praise to Christ our Lord, number 310, Jesus the everlasting word, the Father's only Son, God manifestly seen and heard, and heaven's beloved one. Number 310.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We come before you, O Lord, our Father, and we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, the one who has shined the light of your glory into our lives and who has made known to us your great salvation. How we praise you, Lord, for the wonders that he has done that he's made known to us, the wonders of your love, of your mercy, of your surpassing glory, and above all, the sheer mystery that, that you, the great God, should have to do with us, with men and women who fall so far short of your glory. But you have loved us and done so with an everlasting love. And you've touched our hearts, and you've blessed us, and you've forgiven our sins, and you've made us your own. And we can scarcely believe, Lord, that this can be true. And yet your word tells us page after page of the grace that there is through Christ the Savior for all who love him, for all who trust him, for all who cast their lives upon he who is the Lamb of God, in whose uncreated light, as we've sung, the heart of God is revealed to us forever and ever, a heart that inclines towards us in loving mercy and care and compassion, that meets all of our needs and guards all of our ways. How wonderful it is, Lord, to be a people who have seen the joy of your great salvation. And so we delight as we meet together this day, as we meet to hear your gracious word, to answer you in the prayers of our hearts and the songs of our lips. And so we pray, Lord, that you would draw near to us and be among us this morning. Keep us, we beseech thee, O Lord. Keep thy church with thy perpetual mercy. And because the frailty of man without thee cannot but fall, keep us ever by thy help from all things hurtful and lead us into all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let me greet you very warmly indeed this morning, uh, very especially if it's your first time with us. If you're up here, I can see you. I can't see those downstairs. I hope you can see us and hear us, uh, but at any rate, you're very welcome indeed. We're going to be uh, studying the Scripture shortly, but before we do that, here are one or two notices for you, and uh, you might like to look at these sheets that are on your chairs. Uh, there are lots of notices there. I won't go through them all, but I do want to mention one or two things. A particular welcome to students, and uh, if you're new students, come to Glasgow to study at one of our universities or colleges, then you're very particularly welcome. There's uh, lunch for you uh, after the service. There are numbers of uh, our church families. Uh, some are away, obviously, because of the holiday weekend, but many of us are here, and we'd love to give you lunch today. So there'll be coffee and cake downstairs. That's in the room uh, straight facing you down at the bottom of the stairs uh, after the service, and uh, you'll be able to meet there folks from our fellowship who'd love to take you home for lunch. So do stay and uh, share fellowship with our folk uh, today. Also, to tell you that uh, on Thursday evening, we have our main event for students and young workers called Release the Word. Uh, it's for home students and for internationals, and uh, it's a great way to make friends, to find fellowship in Christ, but to do that as we study God's Word together, uh, together all in one group, and then uh, after we've eaten in small groups uh, around tables uh, as we study God's Word. So do come along. It's not too late. It began last week, but that was introductory, and uh, it's uh, perfectly fine for you to come along this week. Uh, don't miss that. It's a great, great opportunity uh, for you. We also meet on Wednesday evenings at Congregation for Prayer. You'll see at 7.30 here. And uh, again, I'd encourage all to come and join us as we pray for God's work all throughout the world but very especially for our mission partners in different places, and of course for the work here in our own church uh, and in our own country. You'll see at the top right, 
Uh, today, again, is our harvest offering. We're gathering money this year for persecuted believers in the Middle East, especially those in Iraq and Syria who are suffering greatly at the hand of the Islamic State, and we're doing so through the work of the Barnabas Fund. So please, uh, can I encourage you to give generously uh, to that. One matter of congratulations to uh, our associate pastor, Edward Lobb, who yesterday became a grandfather. And uh, we welcome Arthur Edward Lobb into the world. So, Edward, you don't look old enough to be a grandfather, but I'm sure you probably feel it. And uh, <laughs> congratulations to all the family. Well, you'll see on the notice sheet there is a notice about Christianity Explored. And uh, rather than me explain it, we're going to watch a little video now uh, just to tell you a little about what that's all about. Well, when I first came in 2003, I really did not know anything about the Christian faith. I'd been brought up in a, a household where we never went to church, we never spoke about anything to do with this. Um, so I, I came along really not knowing at all what Christians believed. Although I knew I was a Christian in my heart, but I didn't know what that meant. So the Christmas after I started coming to the Tron, um, they were running Christianity Explored, so I thought, right, I'm going to go on to that and find out what this all is about. Um, so I came on to that, and that's where I first started learning about Christianity. I have to say that Christianity Explored was probably a turning point in my Christian life, uh, having gone through the first two or three sessions, the first two or three weeks, there was a sense of, uh, you know, I thought I was a Christian, but now I'm getting teaching and a, a, an ability to understand better the Gospel uh, through uh, reading and, and studying Mark's Gospel. It, it was really just uh, such a, a watershed in my Christian life, I would have to say. It's a you know, wonderful basis for me. Um, so just going and hearing the very simple explanations of who Jesus is, why he came, and uh, what, what he expects from us. Well, if, if you've got a friend or just somebody you know, a relative, somebody who's been asking questions about the faith, um, about your faith, about what you believe, this is a perfect place to bring them along. There's absolutely nothing to be frightened of. It's not a, it's not a course that you will be asked uh, questions and uh, put to the test in any way. Very relaxed, very informal. Uh, it's no longer just down to you to answer the questions. There's good talks, there's the, um, there'll be other table leaders, there'll be other Christians there to help answer those questions. Um, you know, it is at your pace, you can ask any question, and you will get an answer, and if we don't have an answer in the evening, we'll certainly get it for the next one. Well, I hope that uh, that gives you a little flavor, and uh, do be thinking about that, and do pray about that uh, as to who you might be able to bring uh, along. Well, we're going to turn to our Bibles now, and uh, to Luke's Gospel once again. If you have one of our church Bibles, I think that is page 858, and we're going to be reading chapter 3 and a bit of chapter 4. We've been seeing already in the first two chapters how carefully uh, Luke orders his material. He tells us that right at the beginning. And chapter 3 and chapter 4 are no uh, exception to that. Uh, you'll see if you read these chapters, there are four sections really. Um, the preparation for Jesus' ministry from John, the, the forerunner, and the introduction of Jesus, uh, and then the teaching of Jesus himself. So chapter 3, verse 1, down to chapter 4, verse 13. <laughs> We have, first of all, John in the desert and at the Jordan, and then we have Jesus at the Jordan and in the desert. And you'll see, uh, as we read, that that whole section begins with a quotation from Isaiah the prophet. Then if you look at chapter 4, from verse 14 onwards, you'll see 
what we get there is two sections of Jesus teaching in the synagogues uh, in Nazareth. And again, surprise, surprise, it begins with a quote from Isaiah the prophet. So none of this is accidental. Luke is ordering this very careful for, carefully for us. And it's as though in the first two of these episodes, he's saying to us, look, do you want to see God's salvation? Well, look at the Son of God. And then in the next two, he's saying, well, do you want to hear about God's genuine salvation? Well, listen. Listen to the Son of God as he teaches you the Scriptures uh, in the synagogues. So let's read uh, beginning at Luke chapter 3, verse 1, which is all about the announcement of the Savior uh, to the world. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Traconitus, and Lysianus tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds ask him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to him to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more taxes than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod, the tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, that means he had taken his brother's wife and married her, and for all the other evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Now, when the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mahat, the son of Levi, and so on. Verse 31 the son of David, notice, the son of Jesse. Verse 33, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. And notice the last verse, 38, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, 
command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, He departed from him until an opportune time. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. Well, we're going to sing the hymn on the screens now about prayer and about how often it is that when we come before God in prayer, we feel that our sins must make him turn away. But it is not so because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, as we have a few moments of quiet and the musicians play, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bring offerings before you and ask that you would take them and use them along with all the other giving of this fellowship, we pray, Lord, that you would use them as you use us to bring the light of the knowledge of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ to the darkness of this world. We're conscious, Lord, in a week where our parliament has been recalled once again to vote to put our armed forces into a state of war, along with many others in the coalition of nations seeking to combat the advance of the Islamic State. Our hearts fear and tremble. And once again, we are reminded of the darkness of the evil that is in this world where war and rumors of wars are constantly a feature of human life. This, O oh God, is what the Lord Jesus himself promised would be true until the end, until the day of his coming in final judgment, final separation, final restoration of this whole universe. So we're not surprised, but we are nevertheless grieved. And we pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayers and grant us the desires of our heart, that there might be a restraint of evil and wickedness in our world, that there might be increasingly the pursuit of peace among the nations of this planet. We pray against those who warmonger for their own gain, for twisted and warped ideology's sake, for the lure of wealth and of power, and so many of these things which stalk the heart of man. We're not naive enough, Lord, to assume that there are such clear-cut cases of wrong and right amongst nations. We know that things are so complex that there is sin and folly in the heart of every man and in the policy of every government and nation. But we know, Lord, that there are examples of the worst and most extreme kind of darkness and wickedness which must be stood up to and cannot be tolerated. So we pray for our armed forces and that of others who are seeking to bring an end to the wanton violence and destruction and the havoc being wreaked by the Islamic State. And we ask, Lord, that this conflict may be brought to a swift and a good end. We pray, Lord, for our own nation in these tumultuous days of politics and party conferences. We're so conscious, Lord, of the almost calamitous loss of trust in public life, cynicism about our governors and our leaders. So much, Lord, that has caused our population to rise up in anger in so many different ways. We pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom, the wisdom of righteousness to those who have the lead over us. We pray that we as Christian believers would play our right part in all of these things, exercising our democratic rights wisely and responsibly, but also praying as you command us to do for all kings and rulers in authority, that they might govern in ways that will prosper the cause of your gospel and will prosper the lives of ordinary people, granting them peace and prosperity. Help us, Lord, in our own hearts, not to be blighted with cynicism, but nor to be filled with naive optimism, but to take our lead from the truth, the plumb line that is your word. We pray for your church, O oh God, in this nation, asking that you would bring restoration and revival to her, a renewed turning to your infallible word, a renewed love for your gospel of power, which alone can touch the hearts of men and women and alone can bring life from the dead. 
we grieve, Lord, that in so many places, the church today, so beset on every side by the hostility of secularism and also of other religions that so often it seems to want to tread the path of peace, of least resistance, seeking the favor of all men. Remind us, lords, of your own words, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Remind your church, O God, that there is a cost to stand for the truth that is in Jesus Christ, the unassailable truth which cannot be changed. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are suffering for that stand for the truth. And we pray very tenderly and especially this morning for the congregation of Holyrood Abbey in Edinburgh in this their last Sunday before they too are ejected from their building because of their stand for the truth. We pray, Lord, today you would be with them in manifest power that you would comfort their hearts, thrill their souls with the joy of knowing you and loving you and serving you. We pray that you would erase from their hearts and their minds all sentimental attachments to bricks and mortar, even though that place where they have met carries for them so many very precious memories of all that you have done in their lives in the past. Lead them on, we pray, O God, that from this day forward, as you have done for us here and many others, you might give a cleansing of the past and a looking to the future with joy and expectation. And may that fellowship of your people know the blessing of your power at work in the midst, that you would add to their number those who are being saved and that you would fill their hearts with the joy of your salvation. And so, Lord, as we turn our own minds and our hearts this morning to your great salvation, we pray that you would open our eyes and the eyes of our hearts, that we might see and hear and drink in and understand the riches of your glorious grace made known to us in Jesus Christ your beloved Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. We sing again the hymn on the screens as we come to God's Word. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy Word.
Well, turn with me, if you would, back to Luke's Gospel at chapter 3, page 858, if you have one of the uh, church visitors' Bibles. Some years ago, at the turn of the millennium, uh, there was a very significant exhibition in the National Gallery in in Trafalgar Square called Seeing Salvation. It was all about uh, the depiction in Christian art of the person of Jesus Christ, uh, depictions of his birth, his life, his death, uh, and indeed his resurrection and ascension uh, to glory. And it was mostly masterpieces of Renaissance art that uh, dominated uh, the exhibition. Of course, while some of the portraits were uh, quite carefully informed by uh, the biblical picture, others were much more uh, shaped by uh, medieval Catholic tradition. But it was the title that I thought was quite brilliant, Seeing Salvation. Because according to Luke, our gospel writer, to behold the true portrait of Jesus Christ is to see God's salvation. That's what Simeon said we saw last time, wasn't it, in chapter 2, verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation, as he saw the infant Jesus. And now, uh, having set the scene in the first two chapters of the gospel with the arrival of the Savior, what we have in chapters 3 and 4 is the public announcement of Christ the Savior to the world. So that if you look at chapter 3, verse 6, all flesh will see the salvation of God in the person of the Savior, Jesus Christ. So the question is, what is the authentic portrait of Jesus that truly reveals the nature of of what God's salvation really means? That's the $64,000 question. Because today, just as in the first century, people have very different impressions about what salvation actually means, just as uh, artists have very different impressions about what Jesus was really like. People have their own idea of what salvation really is. But what is biblical salvation? What is the real message of salvation according to the orthodox Christian faith that was once for all delivered to the saints and handed down to the church for all time? Put it another way, what is the genuine Christian gospel, the good news that verse 18 here tells us that John was proclaiming? The good news of great joy, as the angels called it, remember, the good news of the kingdom of God as Jesus himself will call it in chapter 4, verse 43. Well, if we want to find the answer to that question, we will find it authoritatively, not, I'm afraid, in the National Gallery in that exhibition, wonderful as those paintings were, but we will find it in the definitive portrait that Luke gives us right here in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the testimony of John, in the testimony of God himself about Christ, the Savior, who has arrived in the world. We will see in what we read here the true portrait of salvation. So what does it mean that all flesh will see the salvation of God? Well, look first at the beginning of chapter 3. The first couple of verses are very impressive. It's a very significant opening, isn't it? I'm sure they remind you, if you know your Bibles, of the opening of some of the great prophetic books of the Old Testament, Isaiah and Jeremiah and so on, who are announced with all this kind of talk about the kings and so on. And it's a very significant announcement because there had been no great prophet like that in Israel in living memory. The last prophet had been the prophet Malachi, nearly 500 years Before this, then there had been a period of darkness and silence. And so this was a momentous thing, signifying the return of the Word of God into the midst of His people. In fact, the return of God Himself into the midst of His people. But notice how Luke tells us that this is not just something for Israel. God's Word thunders into the midst of of the domain of the world emperor, Tiberius, and all his governors, all his tetrarchs, his sub-kings, as well as the high priests representing the religious establishment of Israel. 
It's something that comes to the world. But what is this announcement? Well, this extensive quote right here from the beginning, uh, in the beginning from the book of Isaiah makes very clear that this announcement is the ultimate intervention of God into his world by which at last he will bring all wrongs to right, he will deliver his people, he'll destroy all of his enemies. That's what Isaiah 40 is talking about. Now, of course, Isaiah's prophecy had originally come to Israel in exile, and it had promised them a new exodus, just like when God redeemed his people out of the bondage of Egypt through the desert and into the promised land. That's the language that Isaiah is using here. And he would once again lead them back, redeeming Jerusalem, bringing comfort to Israel forever. And of course, the exiles had returned centuries before. The prophet's words had been fulfilled in a measure. But it was only a pale shadow of what God had actually promised through these prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. If you read Isaiah 40 right to the end of Isaiah chapter 66, you'll see that so very clearly. God promised far, far more than just the return of Israel to the good old days in their land. The redemption, the salvation that he is talking about is nothing less than the restoration of the entire universe. He's talking about a new heavens and a new earth. He's talking about the end of all evil. He's talking about the glorious reign of God's peace throughout the world. Well, that clearly had not yet happened. And that's why Luke told us in chapter 2 that people like Simeon and Anna were longing for the consolation of Israel, longing for the true and ultimate redemption of Jerusalem. They were waiting for everything that God had promised of his great salvation, salvation for the entire world. But now, says Luke, it is nothing less than that that John the Baptist's ministry is saying is about to unfold. This at last is the great day of the Lord that's about to dawn. And that's what explains the seeming paradox in this passage before us. I'm sure you recognize it when we read it together. John in verse 18 says that he is proclaiming good news. As verse 6 says it's about, it's about salvation to all flesh. But look at verse 7. John's first words are about wrath to come. There's no doubt that John is a preacher full of fire and judgment. So how on earth does that fit with this idea of salvation? Well, of course, the answer is that according to the prophets, the day of the Lord would be a great and awesome day. It would be the day of final judgment upon this world. And the whole world would be purged in the fires of judgment. And that it would be through that great fire that God's people would be saved. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. That's what God said through Moses to Israel way back at the time of the Exodus. And that redemption, that exodus from Egypt, that redemption was a foreshadowing of the ultimate redemption of God's people from the bondage of sin by God's judgment upon sin. That's why we're told so clearly that John's message was to prepare people for that coming day of judgment, that he was to point them to a salvation that could only come through the forgiveness of sins so that that day would be a day of joy for people and not a day of calamity. Do you remember Zechariah had prophesied in his song about John in chapter 1, verse 77? You will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of their sins. That's what the angel had said to Zechariah John would do as well. He will turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a people who are prepared. Prepared to face the judge of all the earth. And that's why verse 3 says, John came proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
Now, if you read the very last chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah, you'll see very clearly what is true right through the Old Testament and indeed right through the New Testament, that the great and glorious day of the Lord is both the day of restoration of all things, yes, God's glory being declared among the nations, all flesh coming to worship Him, but it is also the great day of wrath. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment with all flesh. Isaiah 66, verse 16. And it is the sunrise of that day that John's ministry marks and that Jesus' coming begins for the world. It's the return of the Lord to Zion that the prophets spoke about, that Israel longed for. It's the good news that God comes to reign, but God's reign will bring both restoration and wrath. He bears His holy arm in judgment, and only then will all flesh see the salvation of God. And it's both of these things that Luke therefore emphasizes for us right here at the start of Jesus' ministry. It is a coming day of wrath, and so there is a need for repentance towards God. But it is also the great day of restoration, and so there is a need for real renewal. And without both of these things, no one will see God's salvation. So let's look firstly at chapter, one, at chapter 3, verses 1 to 20, which emphasizes the coming of Jesus' kingdom means for all flesh a day of wrath, which means that there must be real repentance. John's message is very clear here. Turn. Turn from the sin that can only lead to everlasting ruin for all humanity. John's message wants to make us see what we really are, but what we cannot remain if we are to be at peace with a holy God, if we are to be citizens of His holy kingdom. And that's always what the gospel does. And so whenever that true gospel message is proclaimed, when it faces people with the truth about God's salvation, it provokes a crisis. It provokes division. Because in a very real sense, the judgment, the separation of the last day is brought right into the present day in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus. And both the revelation of the truth and in people's response to the truth. And Luke records for us here both the revelation of John's message and the response to it. You see verses 7 to 9 and verses 16 to 18, we get the revelation of John's message. He preached good news, says verse 18, gospel. Literally, he gospeled them. He announced God's day of salvation, as verse 6 says. The same gospel of the kingdom that Jesus himself would proclaim. The, the imagery here comes from Isaiah chapter 52, where God tells uh, his people to wake up, Jerusalem, awake. Why? Because the messenger comes and brings good news. Good news of peace, of salvation, saying your God reigns. And that's what the kingdom of God coming means. It means the reign of God on earth. But you see, the prophet there is very clear what that means. It means God has raised his mighty arm. And wherever you read in the Bible of God's arm being raised, it is his arm that bears his sword of judgment. And we can't miss, can we, that John's message here is not any different from that. His gospel, his good news, look at verse 9, verse 7, it speaks of wrath to come. Verse 9, it speaks of the fire of God's punishment. Indeed, verse 16, do you see? He says that the Christ who will follow him baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's not two separate things, it's just one. It's the image of God's presence all through the Bible. To encounter God is to encounter fire. And for God to come means a baptism of fire. Now, John recalls the prophet Malachi here, the very last of the Old Testament prophets. And God said through him, my messenger will come to prepare the way for me. 
and the Lord whom you long for will suddenly come to his temple. But who can endure the day of his coming? It will not be what you want it to be, for he is a refiner's fire, and he will purify. He will draw near to you, said Malachi, in judgment. And that is John the Baptist's revelation. That is his good news. That is his gospel. Do you want to see genuine salvation, says John? Well, this is a very real part of it. That's what Luke's telling us here. Now, you might be sitting there, and I wouldn't be surprised if you're not sitting there thinking, well, I'm not too keen on the side of that <laughs> gospel. And maybe you're thinking, well, this is John the Baptist. Anyway, John the Baptist wasn't really there. He didn't have the full story. This isn't, this isn't really the proper New Testament gospel yet, is it? Well, there is some truth in that, but only half truth. Because I'm afraid on this aspect, John did have the whole story. You can't read through Luke's gospel and his second volume, Acts of the apostles and be in any doubt about that. Listen, don't turn up, just listen what Peter says in Acts chapter 10 when Cornelius asks him the genuine gospel message that God commanded him to speak. Jesus commanded us, says Peter, to preach and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. That is the apostolic New Testament gospel according to Peter. And it is so because, according to Revelation 14, verse 6, it is the eternal gospel, the gospel for every nation and tribe and people. Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. That's what John's saying, isn't it? Jesus comes as a refiner's fire, to purify, to sift, to separate people for eternity. Look at verse 17. The Messiah has a winnowing fork in his hand. That's to toss up the grain and the chaff into the sky so that it falls and separates the wheat and the chaff. And the wheat will be saved, but the chaff will be burnt with unquenchable, never-ending fire. Now, John is very clear, verse 16. He says, I am not the Messiah. I can only warn you about this. I can only pour water on you and call you to repent, but he who comes, he will do all that I speak of. And in case you doubt, read later on in Luke chapter 12, you'll see that Jesus uses exactly the same language of his own ministry. I came, he said, to cast fire on the earth. That's my baptism that I will accomplish. I will not bring peace but division. Father from son, mother from daughter, in-law from in-law. Division even within households. People will be divided in their response to the gospel of Jesus. And their verdict on Jesus and his gospel now is what determines Jesus' verdict on them for all eternity, whether they are found to be wheat or chaff. And that was John's message. And for his generation, do you see verse 8, which was full of presumption in their privileged pedigree descended from Abraham. For that generation, there was a deadly, deadly warning. Verse 9, do you see? The axe is already at the root of the tree, ready to chop it down and cast it in the fire. Something that we see all the way through Luke, Jesus challenging that generation. Could there have been a more privileged generation in history to see literally with their own eyes the salvation of God in the person of Jesus Christ? But again and again, Jesus says, this is an evil generation. A generation worse than the Ninevites that we'll be hearing about tonight because they repented at the warning of Jonah and one greater than Jonah is here and they have not repented. And John warns that privileged generation. He warns them not to presume on their pedigree. Repent, he says. Turn. 
and bear genuine fruits of repentance. Blessed as God had said through Malachi, if they do not turn at the preaching of the Elijah figure whom John fulfills, God will strike the whole land with a curse. And the truth of Scripture, friends, and the truth of history is that that generation did not repent en masse. Instead, they, they crucified the Son of God. And so, as Jesus himself had prophesied, before that generation passed away, their city, Jerusalem, and their temple was utterly destroyed forever in A.D. 70 by the Romans. John warned his generation. But you see, if Revelation 14 is true, this gospel is an eternal gospel. It's a gospel for every generation, including our generation. The message of Jesus brings the judgment of the last day right into the present day, and it confronts men and women like you and me with the truth about God's salvation, that it is salvation and that it is the only salvation from the fire of God's judgment upon sin. And if John's message was fearsome, announcing that Jesus the judge was coming, how much more fearsome is the message that the apostles themselves proclaimed after Jesus had risen, saying, this Jesus whom you crucified has been raised and appointed Lord and Christ. Or as Paul said to the people of Athens, he has fixed a day when he will judge the earth in righteousness. And so he commands all men everywhere to repent. Friends, not only is Judgment Day coming. The date is fixed, says the New Testament. And it is most certainly a lot nearer now than when Paul first spoke those words. And moreover, if we believe Jesus and his words, that day is not only fixed for the world, but that day is fixed for every single human being. And none of us knows how close that day might be. When we get to chapter 12, we'll see Jesus speaking to a man who thought he had it all and thought he had plenty of time to think about those things later on. And God said to him, you fool, because this night you will stand before your judge. Friends, are we ready for that? I don't think there could be any more important question in the whole world or in your life than that question, could there? That was John's question. That was John's message. And he was clear. You are not ready. His, dem his revelation demanded a response from people to make them ready. You must repent, he said, because without that, forgiveness is not possible. And it must be real. Verse 7, do you see? Not just like snakes fleeing away from a fire, but still being snakes. No, you're to bear fruit root in keeping with repentance. And again, John's call is just that that is echoed by Jesus and by all his apostles. Jesus constantly said to pious people, religious people who thought they were all right, who thought, oh no, we don't need to repent. No, you're wrong, he said. You have to get real. It's not just about words. It's about actions. Hear my words and do them, said Jesus. Bear fruit, and prove to be my disciples, he says in John 15, verse 8. He says exactly that, doesn't he, in Luke chapter 10, to that lawyer who tests him. And he gives Jesus just the right answer in words about how you inherit eternal life. Remember, it's about inheriting life. It's not about earning life at all. But Jesus says, yes, you're right. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. That is the wisdom of righteousness. That is the way of life. But it's got to be a reality, not just a pretense. And he exposed that man, didn't he, by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. And it was the Samaritan, the scumbag to the Israelites, not the pious priest of Israel who proved to be a neighbor and showed in his life that he really did love the Lord his God with all his heart and therefore his neighbor as himself. 
And Jesus said to that man, go and do likewise. Bear fruit in keeping with real repentance. Stop being proud. Stop being presumptuous about your spiritual pedigree. Stop being a viper. Talking a lot of piety, but actually full of poison. Well, John's preaching was pretty fearsome. And verse 10 tells us that many in the crowd were cut to the heart by his message. They say, what must we do? They say just exactly what they said to Peter on the day of Pentecost. What must we do? And so John helps them to see what it means to turn from their sins. They must truly love God above all things, and therefore truly love their neighbor as themselves. That means repenting of worldly and selfish attitudes, verse 10. Loving themselves more than God. Greed for themselves instead of pleasing God and sharing His gifts with others. Well, is that really us? They're to repent, verse 12, of worldly and selfish ambition, seeking wealth and glory for themselves the wrong way, sinfully, worshiping wealth, worshiping authority, which is idolatry. They're to repent, verse 14, from worldly and selfish attitudes, misusing power for self-gain and being discontented with what God has given us. In other words, they are to turn from the sin that is behind all sin, which is a rebellion against God's created order for us as human beings, putting ourselves at the center of the universe and demanding that God serves us instead of us serving Him who is the center of the universe. As Paul says in Romans 1, turning the truth of God into a lie and worshiping and serving the creature, not the creator. And real repentance means turning decisively away from disobedience and towards the wisdom of true righteousness, turning from our fractured and fallen humanity, which can only bring us to everlasting ruin under God's wrath. But there's the problem, isn't it? John says it himself. John can only do what Moses and all the other prophets could do. He can declare God's righteousness, he can expose sin, and he can promise that salvation can only come from God himself. All John can do is is baptize with cold water. He can call people to repent. He cannot impart forgiveness and restoration to sinful people. But John's unique ministry, which made him the greatest of all the prophets, according to Jesus, was that he could point people quite literally to the one who could do that and who now would do that for all who would trust in him and abandon their pride and presumption and turn to him in obedient faith. John's message was just as Paul says in Romans chapter 3, that no one is righteous and therefore all have to repent and can't be righteous, but that now our righteousness of God has been manifested in the flesh. The law and the prophets bear witness to it, but now it's here in Jesus for all who believe, or to use Luke's language, for all who truly repent. And that's why Luke concludes John's ministry of repentance here and then immediately shows us Jesus in his baptism and his genealogy and his temptation. Because Luke is telling us that not only does the coming of God's kingdom mean that the day of wrath has begun and it demands real repentance, a turning from sin that leads only to everlasting ruin, But also he's telling us that the coming of Jesus means that the day of ultimate restoration has also begun and that it delivers real renewal. And Luke's message in this second section is equally clear. He's saying, turn to the Son who alone can bring everlasting renewal for all humanity. Luke wants us to see what we are not but what we must become if we're to be at peace with a holy God. And he wants us to see that true salvation 
is not simply an undoing of the ruin of sin, but it is the restoration of the beauty of holiness that is human life as God purposed it to be. True earthly sons of the Heavenly Father. I could spend weeks on this passage alone, but I want you to see the message that Luke is telling us by grouping these things together right here. I'm sure you can see the starkness of the contrast. Having confronted proud and and presumptuous and, and unholy humanity in its sin, he now turns us to something totally different, the humble, obedient, holy humanity of Jesus, the true Son of the Father. Look at the events of Jesus' baptism. He's saying, look, Jesus is the true heavenly Son of God. Matthew gives us lots more detail about the events of the baptism, but all of Luke's focus is on verse 22, do you see? On heaven's verdict on Jesus. Here is one who is called God's beloved Son. He's quoting from Psalm 2 about God's Messiah King. But notice the absolute uniqueness of this, the Holy Spirit of God, the one who conveys God's own holy presence, descends upon him in bodily form. The fullness of God himself dwells in this man bodily. He is pleased to dwell in him, as Paul says to the Colossians. Here is a man, here is the true Son of God, utterly at peace with God, who is not under God's wrath. Remember the angels proclaimed peace on earth towards men with whom God is well pleased. He says, with this one, I'm well pleased. The only man, if John is right, who can be at peace with God and absolutely at one with him. The only man for whom heaven is open and there is perfect communion with the Father's dwelling place. Adam, do you remember, closed Eden forever to Adam and his progeny, shut out from God's presence. But here Jesus is opening heaven by his prayer. What none of us are or can be, Jesus is. He is a true heavenly Son of God. And yet He is also a true human Son of God. That's the whole point of Luke putting this long genealogy here where he places it, and especially the message that he gives us by focusing on that very last verse. Do you see verse 38? He's the Son of Adam, the first Son of God. And that's Luke's whole point. Yes, Jesus is the legitimate son of David and of Abraham. Yes, he's the true king. He's the true Israelite. But much more than that, Luke is flagging up. He's the true human. This is the second Adam, he's saying, to the fight and to the rescue, come. And he comes to restore man in his true humanity as man. He comes to reverse the terrible unmanning of man through the disobedience of sin. Luke's just showing us graphically here what Paul says to us in Romans chapter 5. Just as by one man, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And that obedience is what we see displayed in the temptation. The truly heavenly Son of God, who is the truly human Son of God, the new Adam, is proven to be the truly holy Son of God. You can't miss, can you, in this story of the temptations, the allusions to the Garden of Eden and to the first Adam who so miserably failed. Adam was tempted by food. He was tempted by worldly, selfish appetites, just as Israel was as well in the wilderness when God called Israel his son and said he was testing him. But where Adam failed and where Israel failed, Here, Jesus, the true Son, prevails. And Adam also was tempted with worldly and selfish ambition. You'll be like gods, he says. And so Jesus is likewise tempted to glory and honor through idolatrous worship. But again, where Adam failed and where Israel failed, Jesus triumphs. And Adam was tempted also, wasn't he, with worldly and selfish attitudes, putting God's word to the test. Has God really said that? demanding more from God than God had provided him with. 
And so Jesus here is severely tempted. Satan even uses God's own words against him just the same way. But again, this true Son of God, the second Adam, triumphs in obedient faith. And he's shown to be the truly heavenly, human, and holy Son of God. I wonder if you noticed how similar the three temptations that Jesus resists so powerfully are to the three areas of repentance that John calls his listeners to in chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. It's only Luke who records those verses, and he's so careful he cannot be doing it for any other reason, I think, than to drive home this extraordinary contrast. Look, look what you are not and what you need to be. Look what you need to repent of. And look at him and see what he is and see what you must be if you are to be holy, if you are to be at peace with God, if you are to escape wrath, if you are to be pleasing to your heavenly Father. But the question is, friends, how does that help us to see that Jesus is all of these things? The Son of God who is truly holy, and truly human, who's totally in touch with heaven. Everything that we are not. Doesn't that just make all the more obvious to us that we are not that? Doesn't that drive us to despair? That we will never see his salvation. Well, it would be that if Luke had not told us two crucial things. Look at verse 22 of chapter 3. The first words spoken from heaven do come from Psalm 2 about God's king, but that last part, with you I'm well pleased, that comes from Isaiah chapter 42, the first of the servant songs where God speaks of his coming servant with whom he is well pleased. The Savior, through whom his salvation will come to the ends of the earth the servant who himself will suffer for his people's sins. He was numbered with the transgressors. He will bear the sins of many, says Isaiah 53. And God delights in his heavenly Son because he is the one who will bear away his people's sin. He is the one who will cause many to be counted righteous. Do you see the other thing in verse 21? When Jesus also had been baptized. Doesn't that strike you as odd? Doesn't that strike you as totally wrong after everything I've said? John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for sin. But Jesus is the perfect human, holy Son of God at peace with heaven. He has no sin. He's not under God's wrath. He's well-pleasing to God. Why is he being baptized? Well, you see, as God's servant Savior, His holy, precious Son is numbered with the transgressors, is numbered with the unholy. He is baptized for sins not His own because He came to bear sin that was not His own, but His people's sin in order that his people might be declared righteous with a holiness that is not their own, but is his. And Luke is saying to us here, friends, that in all this great contrast between us and the Lord Jesus Christ, he is our substitute. He bore our sin that led to ruin and the wrath of God, that we might be bequeathed his holiness and be restored to our true humanity, God's everlasting life. And to see salvation, says Luke, is to see truly this great exchange. And so to turn from your sins and the way of wrath and turn to the Savior, the way of restoration and renewal. Now, when John preached, he called people to repent now, but he said to them, you have to wait for that new life, because only Jesus can bring it. He will baptize with the Spirit. But because Jesus did obey, because he was 
God's faithful son, when he prayed, God sent the Holy Spirit to empower his life of perfect human holiness. And when he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, Jesus also said to his disciples, wait, wait for the promised Holy Spirit who will clothe you with power from on high. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And that was the beginning of the great day of restoration of humanity, the restoration of the whole universe. And that means, friends, that today there is no more waiting. In fact, on that very day, Peter preached and said, there's no need to wait any longer when people said, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent, turn from your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No more delay. And countless Jews on that day received the gift of the Holy Spirit and restoration of life, and countless Gentiles afterwards also. And the Jews rejoiced and said, the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the Gentiles. Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And what that means, friends, is that that is true of you. It's true of every one of us here today who has received the word of the gospel with penitence, not with pride. You are clothed with the Holy Spirit of God's Holy Son. You wear the garments of His obedience. And that means that as you and I approach God in prayer and feel that our sins will make him turn away, we hear a voice that says, no, come near. You are my beloved son, my daughter. With you, I am well pleased. With you, I am at peace. Because the Father sees us clothed with the perfect, holy humanity of his son, no longer ruined by sin, but completely restored by Jesus. And of course, although you do still sin and you will battle sin until finally at last you enter in your resurrection body, the Lord Jesus Christ, his spirit will never leave you because we pray with Jesus' promise. And do you remember what he said? How much more will your heavenly father give his Holy Spirit to those who ask him. He will never refuse the prayer of his holy and beloved Son. And that's the joy of those who have seen his salvation. But as I close, let me just close with this warning. None of it's automatic, is it? That's why Luke includes verses 19 and 20 about Herod, because not all did respond to John's preaching. Herod met it with resistance and rage. For Herod, he refused the word because he would not tolerate the Bible's criticism of his own particular sexual behavior. That's still the same, sadly, very often for many people today, or it could be a host of other things. But Herod silenced John the messenger. And three years later, when Herod found himself face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 23 tells us that he was eager to hear him and see some sign. And he questioned Jesus deeply. But we read these fateful words. Jesus made him no answer. Because it was too late. He had silenced the message the word that would have brought him restoration to life, forgiveness of his sins, repentance unto life. And so he was abandoned to a ruin of his own making. And Luke is saying to us, friends, in this chapter, don't be like Herod. Listen to John. Turn from your sin that leads only to ruin. And turn to the Son, who alone brings restoration and renewal and life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts, we pray.
to receive your word of life. Turn us to Jesus, your beloved Son, that in him we might know the joy of your salvation. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Let's sing as we close hymn number 663. Oh, walk with Jesus. You will know how deep, how wide his love can flow. They only fail to prove his love who in the way of sinners robe. Walk with him now. That way is light. Number 663. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.